You can learn to touch like you've never touched before, look like you've never looked before, hear like you've never heard before, feel like you've never felt before, do like you've never done before. You know, senility doesn't come from old age. It comes from not being loved and not feeling useful. KVIE Sacramento presents Dr. Leo Buscalia. Don't miss love. It's an incredible gift. Speaking of love. Thank you. We only have an hour, so uh, let's get going. Uh, isn't it incredible we're going to go up in satellites? You and me. Uh, I think we can make it happen. And the first thing before we go into satellite, now you've seen my new jacket, and I'm going to take it off, okay? <laughs> um, just a little while ago, about a, six or seven months ago, one of my neighbors told me of a little church uh, near my home where they said beautiful spiritual things went on and they wanted me to go and experience it with them. So I told them I'd love to and we went there and no sooner we opened the door of this little church and everybody reached out for me and they took my hand and, and they pet my shoulder and they felt my hair. It was an absolute freak out right at the door, you know. And then they brought me in and there was a lot of singing and a lot of moving around and dancing. And it was a real celebration, sort of the kind of religious experience that some of us really think about and dream about, but don't very often experience. But the high point came when the minister uh, stood up and he said, uh, friends, he said, um, Brother Jonathan is going to give the sermon today. And uh, his subject is going to be faith. And so I sat back ready to hear this and little brother Jonathan stood up and he was about five foot four and he had no hair and he had two beady wonderful Kris Kringle eyes and he stood before everybody for a minute like this and then he folded his hands and he said faith, 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 faith. <laughs> and then he sat down and the minister stood up and with a big smile on his face, he said, thank you, Brother Jonathan, Jonathan, for that beautiful lecture on faith. And I thought, you know, someday I'm going to wise up. And when I go to talk to people like I am tonight about love, I'm going to fold my hands and I'm going to say, love, 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 love. And then I'm going to go home. And it'll be the most beautiful evening we've had, you know. You can stand up and say, oh, that Pascalia really knows his way around love. <laughs> but, you know, I, I, I'm not that secure yet. And so I'm going to spend an hour telling you what this man said in a minute. But, you know, the reason is, is that I'm really concerned about the fact that we all need this thing so much and crave this thing so much and so little of it is seen around and so maybe we do have to talk a little bit about it and uh, one of the times that it, this idea of uh, our being lost and away from love uh, came years and years ago when I was an undergraduate and I took a course in play therapy and uh, those of you who know about it know that you bring a little child and this was for little children uh, because you see in adults we can use language for therapy and we can talk our way into health but uh, with children the natural way is to play and so you bring a child into this room and you give them all the little things that they can act out in and you say uh, let's see you know let's talk let's be together let's share and you can do it in action and I had a little girl who was the first time I'd ever worked with a child that young she was five years old and she did all kinds of incredible things if you think five-year-olds are not aware Thank goodness we're finding out that little infants in cribs know what's going on. And we can do, now we're, we're talking big things like infant stimulation. You know, good mamas knew that years ago when they held them and they loved them and they rocked them and they bounced them and they threw them across the room, you know. <laughs> 
instead of, you know, leave them there and don't you spoil them and don't you touch them and so on and so forth. But anyway, Leilani was going through a lot of things and uh, for several days she was doing something that I really was bothering me. She was getting little pieces of clay and she was rolling them up into three little, like little snowmen and then after she had them all built she'd go POW! <laughs> and she'd say, MOMMY! <laughs> and then she'd do another one and she'd go POW! and she'd say, DADDY! She'd go to her whole family, you know, banging them away, and then she'd want me to do it. <laughs> you know, and, and so you know, being a very terrible uh, child therapist, really awful, you know, because I, I was so involved with these kids and I was supposed to be there just reflecting, oh, Lilani smashed her mother. <laughs> well, I, I just couldn't do that, you know, and I felt sort of involvement, and I said, Lilani, how come you're smashing all the people you love? And she looked at me, you know, sort of indignantly, like a jerk. And she said, because those are the people that are always hurting me. Five years old. And then, again, being a very bad therapist, I said, uh, but I love you and I don't hurt you. And she says, that's because you're crazy. You know, five years old and she'd already learned that love can be painful. And five years old and she'd already learned that unconditional love, you must be crazy. And since then I've done a lot of adult talk shows and you know, we may, we're not too far away from that even now. The phone rings and I say, hi. And this person says, hey, Biscaglia, where is this thing called love? I live in a little apartment house on Melrose and I'm all alone and I don't have the guts or the knowledge about how to break out. Where is it? And so, you know, it doesn't bother me then to go someplace and say, let's talk about love, I don't care. And if you think I'm crazy, that's wonderful because, you know, when you think I'm crazy, that gives me lots of leeway for behavior. I can do almost anything and you say, oh, that's you just crazy, you know, Vascalia. <laughs> But you know, I want to share some not so crazy statistics about love that kind of frighten me and I hope they frighten you. Maybe that's why you're here tonight, too. And that is, do you know that there are about 8,000 suicides in the United States per year? Oh, especially for someone like me that thinks the greatest loss in the world is loss of human potential. I want to scream and say, hey, wait a minute. Don't you know that there are other alternatives? And you know that many of those suicides are people who are over the age of 65. And maybe that tells us a little bit about uh, the way we treat people who are old and how we feel about them and how we, we really kind of, we're a society that detests anything old. We don't want it around. We tear it down. We send it away so we don't have to look at it. Instead of bringing it in and realizing that those people who have lost a sense of history are going to have to relive it themselves. And one of these days you're going to be there. As young and lovely and gorgeous as you are. And unless we do something about it right now, you're going to be stashed away someplace too. The highest suicide rate is above 65 years old that the highest rising rate is among adolescents. 13 and 14 and 15 year old kids who don't even know yet what life is about. And who have never been told how wonderful and magical and spiritual and exciting it can be. And they end it all. And it's finished for them. There isn't a second chance. Did you know that one out of each out of every seven people in the United States are going to need some form of psychotherapy before they reach the age of 40? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, you. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, you. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, you. And that's a lot of hogwash. It isn't necessary. You have all the resources in you to heal yourself, which is what you're going to have to do anyway. You might as well start on that process right now. Do you know that the average length of relationships today is three months? You know, that isn't even time to know whether she likes corned beef sandwiches or pizzas.
No, it's obvious to me that when human love was invented, they didn't give us an instruction manual. Don't miss love. It's an incredible gift. You know, I, I love to think that the day you're born, you're given the world as your birthday present. It frightens me that so few people even bother to open up the ribbon. You know, rip it open. Tear off the top. It's just full of love and magic and life and joy and wonder and pain and tears. All of the things that are your gift for being human. Not only, you know, the really happy things, I want to be happy all the time, I want to do that. No, there's a lot of pain in there, a lot of tears, a lot of magic, a lot of wonder, a lot of confusion. But that's what it means. That's what life is. And so exciting. Get into that box and you'll never be bored. I see people that are always talking about, I'm a lover, I'm a lover. I'm a lover, I really believe in love, I act the part. And then they say to the waitress, where's the water? <laughs> I will believe your love when you show it to me in action, when you can understand that everybody is teaching everybody to love at every moment. And when you ask yourself, am I the best teacher? And if your answer is yes, great, go around, listen to how many times a day you say I love instead of I hate. Isn't it interesting that one of the, that children learn as they learn the process of language, they always learn the word no years before they learn the word yes? Ask linguists, where do they hear it? Maybe if they heard more of I love, I love, I love, they'd say it sooner. Anyway, it's an idea. And so tonight I'm going to be crazy enough to sit with you and talk about love. And many of you know that I was so concerned about the fact, I went and looked at the textbooks in psychology, in sociology, trying to look for among these people who really should be the people concerned about this, to see it indexed, you know it wasn't even indexed? That's how much we think about love. Try to find it. You know, when I wrote my book, Love, it was really funny because my publisher said, oh, Biscaglia, you're going to have to change the, the name because I'm sure that someone has used that name before, you know. So we sent in, I said, why don't you send it in and see what happens. So we sent it in, I got the copyright for love. You know, there are books called, there are books called Love and Hate, Love and Desire, Love and Fear, The Joy and Power of Love, but no one ever thought of a book called Love, L-O-V-E. -E. Such a good word, such a limitless word, such a limitless concept. And so I was crazy enough to decide I'm going to do something about that. So I wrote a book called Love, and it was based upon a love class that I taught, and that was an incredible love class. Some of you know about it. We got together, and I didn't teach that class. I just facilitated it. I came in and sat down, and I told everybody on the first night, you know, it doesn't matter whether anybody else is going to come. Uh, I'm going to be here. Tuesday nights from 7 to 10. Love 1A. And if nobody comes, I'll love myself. was a great class and I learned so much and much of what I write about and tell you about are things that I've learned in this love class and it was just that I, I can't tell you how marvelous it was but I'd like to talk to you a little bit about who is this loving person and even though I've mentioned this in other talks and in books it's so important that we start here and that is that the loving person is the person who loves him or herself and, you know, I say this so often and people say, oh, yes, you're so right, but you don't do it. You will never be able to love anybody else until you love yourself, even with your fat thighs. <laughs> you know, I may not be perfect, but look at me. I'm crazy, wondrous potential. It's 
it's important. You know, Weissel, the wonderful uh, Jewish writer, uh, wrote a beautiful thing in a book called Souls on Fire. He said, when we die and we go to heaven and we meet our maker, our maker is not going to say to us, why didn't you become a messiah? Why didn't you discover the cure for such and such? The only thing we're going to be asked at that precious moment is why didn't you become you? That is your prime responsibility because if it were not, why is it that you are so incredibly unique? Everybody is different. Everybody has something to give that nobody else in the world has. Isn't that enough for you to become enthusiastic about yourself? And also to say to yourself, my goodness, I've got to find out what that is. You know, I tell that to my students and they say, I don't have anything. <laughs> well, if you believe it and you listen to everyone else, they may convince you that that's true. I don't understand why people are always putting us down instead of encouraging us to become, because when you do become, you will give me a world that I couldn't have any other way. You've got something to give me. Do you know that, that I can't get any other way? I probably have the Guinness Book of Records for hugging. And do you know there are no two people that even hug alike? You know, you have the gentle hugger who sort of floats in your arms. You have the jock hugger who goes, rah! You have the back slapper that goes bam, bam, bam. You have the tender lover that just sort of disappears in you and then wiggles. <laughs> Don't tell me that it ever gets boring to hug. But you know, one of the most difficult things you're going to have to do, it should be the simplest, is to be you, to find out who you are and what you have to share and then to dedicate yourself to the process of developing it so that you can give it away to everybody else because that's the only reason in the world for having anything. And the wonderful thing about the self is that it isn't anything that's concrete. You know, if you say, where is that self? I don't know, it certainly isn't your thighs. The thing that you'll leave behind is something that's not tangible. That's what's so wonderful. That's what you'll be leaving. And if you develop that, everyone you touch, you'll leave that too. And there'll be more. But it's going to be a battle. Under the guise of love, oftentimes comes the greatest violation of the person. Because our loves are always with conditions. I will love you if you bring back good grades. I will love you if you're nice and you meet my standards. I like to think if there's only one person in this world who will just say to you, I will love you. You know, that's what home should be. Home is a place that when you go there, they always take you in. And they don't say, I told you so. You shouldn't have done that. But rather, mom and papa go out and get the band-aids and say, sit down, try again. One person, that isn't asking too much. Be that to somebody. And when it's offered to you, accept it. Because it's just as hard, you know, to take it as it is to give it. Some of us find it far harder to take. The hardest battle you're ever going to fight is the battle to be just you. And you're going to have to fight it for the rest of your life in a world where people feel more comfortable if you can be there for their convenience. But you know, if you give it up, there's nothing left. In love class, one evening, we, we always went through insightful things, and one girl said, insight! Well, when that happens, everything stops. You know, everything stops for insight. We said, what is it? She said, now I know I'm so miserable all the time. It's because I expect to be loved by everybody, and that's not possible. I can make myself the most wondrous, the most delectable, the most magical, the most juicy plum in the world. And there may be people that are allergic to plums. <laughs> now there's real insight. And then you know what she said? And then I can make myself over, if they want a banana, into a banana.
but I'll always be the second best banana. Where I could have concentrated on becoming the very best plum and being patient enough to wait until a plum lover came by. <laughs> because you know, if you've stopped being a plum and you've dedicated yourself to being a banana and that per person decides that banana should split, <laughs> you're going to be in great trouble because you're not going to know who you are. R.D. Lang, the wondrous psychiatrist, says, We think much less than what we know. We know much less than what we love. We love much less than what there is. And to this precise extent, we are much less than what we are. But if we can get this stuff together, we can become all that we are. And only then can you say, I am. I am becoming. I am a lover because I give you all that I am with no smoke screens. I'm a genuine plum. And I give myself free. What a nice time to be able to say that. Don't miss it. Don't miss you. Somewhere along the line, encounter yourself. Shake hands and say, how, where the hell have you been all these years? Well, now that we're together, we can go on our way. And you're going to find, you know, that there is no end to you. Your potential is limitless. We've never been able to find a limitation to human potential. You can learn to touch like you've never touched before, look like you've never looked before, hear like you've never heard before, feel like you've never felt before, do like you've never done before. And after you've done it, you realize you're nowhere. You've got all more and more and more and more, all to give away. How fantastic. So that when you're asked, when you get to that gate, have you been you? Have you become you? You say, look! Fat thighs and all. <laughs> but you know, too often we stop there. And if we stop there, it becomes nothing more than a big glorified ego trip. You really become you in the real sense of the word. When you recognize that we're in us. Uh, you know, I was on an airplane recently. You know, I travel a lot. And I really love airports. Some people hate them. I hate getting to airports. But I love airports because I learn more about human behavior in airports than any place in the world. Watch people. Don't be bored. Don't keep looking at what flight's leaving, you know. Watch all the stuff that's going on in that place, the dynamics of things happening. When I got on a plane, I sat next to a kid that looked like he just had about everything, you know. He was a beautiful looking kid and he was going to a, a university in Colorado. And we started to talk. And every other word was I and me. I don't like this, and I don't like this, and schools are for the birds, and professors stink, and the world is awful. And I, you know, finally, being a good non-directive counselor, I said, shut up! <laughs> I said, do you realize how many times in the last 5,000 miles or so you have said, me and I? What about me? What about us and we? He said, who are you? <laughs> Contrasted with that was I was one of those people, you probably heard last year about the uh, O'Hare Airport being completely snowed in, and I mean completely snowed in, for two full days and nights. And I was one of those people that was there. Wouldn't you know it? In fact, I'll tell you something really beautiful. My airplane was the last one to be allowed to land. <laughs> and then it was announced that not only were we stuck in the, you know, that there were no flights going out, but we couldn't leave the airport because there was such a blizzard and it was continuous that they couldn't clear the roads fast enough and so we were stuck at the airport. But you know what they told us, which was so nice? All you can eat, free. <laughs> That's all you have to tell Biscaglia and you've got it made. <laughs> And the bars are open. 
Well, you know, that's heaven. And there were still people that went around screaming at stewardesses. Get me out of this airport! I've got to be in Cincinnati! And I could see in her face, boy, would I love to get you back to Cincinnati. <laughs> On the first flight out, man. Right through the blizzard. Contrasted with these people that went screaming and demanding to get out of there right now was a, wo a wondrous woman. And she went around, you know, mamas that were traveling, that's the fastest way to go. And you go that way, and you have one in your arms, and you have one on a leash. <laughs> and there you are, stranded in the airport, you know, for Biscaglia, who hasn't got one here and one here. It's a joy. For you, it can be pretty tough. She went around saying to them, hey, let me have your kids. I've always wanted to be a kindergarten teacher, and I'm going to start a kindergarten. And while I do this, I tell a wicked story. And while I do this, you go and have a drink and go to the John and get something to eat. And you should have seen this woman in that little place there with all these kids around there and telling them stories and all the kids, you know, and mamas were freed. That was the same situation, the same blizzard, the same, I, you know, what was the difference between this guy that was screaming and this woman who set up a kindergarten? A choice. That's what it was. An incredible, wondrous, magical choice. I recognize you. And I want to help you because my joy comes in that too. Not only that. Giving, 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 giving. You know, there could be a lot of harm in giving, 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 giving. Some of you know that. Sometimes the greatest gift you can give is by holding it back. But in this case, how beautiful. To give, to share, because you have it. And you made the decision that as of now, I'm going to give all that I have to give and make life easier for you. You know, I was one of those lucky people that was able to see uh, the Dalai Lama of Tibet when he came through. And I wish you all could have experienced this man. Talk about faith, faith, faith. You know, he came on the stage and he looked at the Shrine Auditorium full of people and, and we just all, all sort of melted in his warmth. And if there's a man who has a right to be bitter, if there is such a thing as having a right to be bitter, he has. You know what he said? He said, our greatest duty and our main duty is to help others. And then he smiled a little bit and he said, and please, if you can't help him, would you please not hurt him? You know, if each one of us tonight said to ourselves, well, you know, it's just not in me to go out and help people. I can't do it. I have so much of my... But I promise myself that I'm never going to hurt anybody, at least not volitionally. My goodness, what a wondrous place this would be! Every time you see evil conjuring up in your mouth, stick your fist in it. Say, no, I, wa I know something about... Oh. <laughs> in a little while, it'll become second nature to shove your fist in. And then you won't have to anymore. And the response you get by being positive, because positiveness begets positiveness. Everybody, you know, that we hear that and we laugh about it, but everybody loves a lover. We think they're a little bit crazy, but we like them around. So it's wonderful to be able to reach out. Because when you reach out and you take in, you get a really positive mirror. It's the only real way we have of seeing ourselves. But the minute we become two and then three and then four, do you realize how much more we get? When I take you in my life, I now have four arms instead of two. Two heads, four legs. Two possibilities of joy. Sure, two possibilities of tears. But I can be there while you cry, and you can be there while I cry, because nobody should ever cry alone. Nobody should ever die alone. And you know that in Los Angeles, I hope you haven't got it in San, or San, or Sacramento or San Francisco or New York or any other place, we have a service that you can hire someone to sit with you while you're dying for $7.50 an hour. That's repulsive! 
If you reach the point of death and you don't have one person who's going to hang on to your hand, review quickly your life. No one should die alone. And if you want these people in, we're going to have to reach out for them. And we're going to have to risk. And we're going to have to learn again to trust. You know, I love that story of this guy going up this road. It's a very narrow road going up in the mountains. Only two lanes. And he gets up to a place where there's a very, very precarious, you know, curve in the road. And just as he's about to turn, a woman comes zipping around in her car. And she sees him and she sticks right out the window and she says, Pig! And he says, why, you... And he screams back at her, sow, sow, and he turns the corner and hits a pig. <laughs> you know, we don't believe people want to do good anymore. Just try to get on an L.A. freeway sometime. You know, I'm sitting there in my car, and I see these people with these determined expressions. Death to you, Bascalia! And you know, it's so funny because when I slow down to allow someone to enter, which I love to do, I'm never in that much of a hurry. And I say, come on, you know, they don't believe me. I almost get clobbered because they're saying, me, me, and then, yes. <laughs> Makes our day. But you know, we really become human at the point of reaching out and risking and trusting to bring people in. Uh, I, I've told this story before, and I've even written about it, but it's such a great story that it gives me a joy just to talk about it. And that is, a, uh, I had a student, I, 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 there are many things in my classes that I call voluntarily mandatory. Uh, many of you know about a lot of them. One that's ma very ma voluntarily mandatory is that everybody do something for somebody else. And do you know, I come from a fairly affluent school, as many of you know, and the people there, sometimes the students drive Mercedes, uh, the, the, we drive Fords. <laughs> it's all right, I get there just the same. But um, they come to you and they actually say to you, what do you mean do something for somebody? What's there to do? You know, I get very close to strangulation. <laughs> I, I contain myself, I say, what's there to do? You know, one of these kids came to me, his name is Joel, and he's become notorious because I tell this story so much, and he loves it, and I have his permission to tell it. But he said to me, actually, what's there to do? And I said, Joel, come here. And not far from USC, there was a convalescent home, and I brought him in there. And, you know, everybody should go if you want to see the future, go to a convalescent home. I brought him inside, and here were a lot of aged people lying around in beds in old cotton gowns, staring at the ceiling. You know, senility doesn't come from old age. It comes from not being loved and not feeling useful. As long as you feel useful, you'll never be old. And you know, don't let anybody else, don't depend on others. You do it yourself. You stay active. You find things to do and meaningful things. Not busy work, meaningful things. And then you see when you get to be 170. Bascalia was right. <laughs> anyway, he walked in and he looked around and he said, what'll I do here? And I said, nothing, Joel. He said, I don't have, I don't know anything about gerontology. I said, good. I said, you see that lady over there? You go over and say hello. That's all, that's all. He went over to her and he said, she, you know, she must have been sent by God. He went over and he said to her, um, hello. And she looked at him sort of suspiciously for a minute. She said, are you a relative? <laughs> and he said, no, I'm not. And she said, good, I hate my relatives. <laughs> Sit down, son. And he sat down and they started to rap. Oh, my goodness, the things she told him. Like I said, you know, when we ignore our sense of history, we're doomed to repeat everything over again. 
this woman had known so many wondrous things about life, about love, about pain, about suffering, even about approaching death, with which she had to make some kind of peace. And pretty soon that day began to begin known as Joel's day, and he would come and all the people would come there. And you know what she did, which was so wonderful? She asked her daughter, whom she hated, because she used to say, my daughter comes reluctantly, I can tell. The old. We were so many that we used to have to put those wooden horses and put boards on the top because there were so many people around the table. Oh, and Papa had a wonderful technique about education. Just gorgeous. You know, he never let anyone leave the table until we had all told something new that we had learned that day. We thought that was horrible. And when my sisters and I were washing our hands in the bathroom, I'd say, what did you learn? My sisters would say, nothing. And I'd say, we better learn something. <laughs> and then we'd go sit down at the table and you'd eat these marvelous meals where odors were enough to just have the gophers flip. You know? And then Papa would sit back and he would pour his last little glass of wine. He'd curl his little mustache, had a beautiful little curl on the mustache. And he'd say, Felice, what did you learn today? And you know, we had memorized something out of the encyclopedia. <laughs> and you'd say, the population of Nepal is three million for... And he would say, huh. <laughs> you know, and as a kid, I'd think, what a cuckoo man. <laughs> and I say to my friends, do you have to tell your father something new? they say, I don't even see my father. <laughs> and then he'd look down the table and he'd say to my mama, Rosa, did you know that... And she'd say, hell, I didn't even know where Nepal was. <laughs> so we'd get the dictionary, we'd look it up in the encyclopedia. We'd find out where it was. It was so much fun. And all of us always had something to share. And even now, you know, when Felice works a hundred hours a day, and he crawls in his sack, he lies back and he says to himself, Felice, what did you learn today? And if Felice can't find something, I hear Papa's voice saying, Encyclopedia. <laughs> and then I can sleep. Life is not a trip in itself. It's not a goal. It's a process. You get there step by step by step by step. And if every step is wondrous and every step is magical, that's what life will be. And you'll never be one of those people who reach the point of death without ever having lived because you've never missed a thing. Don't look over other people's shoulders. Look in their eyes. Don't talk at your children. Take their faces in your hands and talk to them like this. Don't make love to a body. Make love to a person. Touch her. Braille her. And do it now because that moment doesn't last forever. It's fast disappearing, and it'll never come again. And most of us spend our lives crying over past moments. There's still a million more. One of my colleagues had a massive heart attack the other day. His wife called, he was something like 52 years old. They called the daughter who lived in Arizona to come out at once. She was 22. She rented a car at the L.A. International Airport and drove on the Los Angeles freeway and was in a violent accident in which she was killed. She was 22 and she's dead. He has recuperated. You never know. It's a great, wondrous mystery. And the only thing we know that we have for sure is what is right here, right now. Don't miss it. To use it all up is love. Now, I just like to end with something that I, I'm still working on, but it's kind of a, a, a thing I call a start. And maybe I can get through it in three minutes or something. And if not, they'll turn me off and I'll continue. Um, each day... Each day I promise myself not to try to solve all of my life problems at once. Nor shall I expect you to do so. You know, take it easy. You can't be the perfect lo lover tomorrow, but maybe next week. <laughs> Starting each day, I shall try to learn something new about me and about you and about the world I live in so that I may continue to experience all things as if they have been newly born. You know, you're not the same person 
after tonight you're different. And when you walk through those leaves walking away, you're going to be different. And tomorrow morning after breakfast, you're going to be different, even if it only means you're a little bit fatter. Starting each day, I shall remember to communicate my joy as well as my despair so that we can know each other better. And starting each day, I shall remind myself to really listen to you and to try to hear your point of view and discover the least threatening way of giving you mine, remembering that we're both growing and changing in a hundred different ways. And starting each day, I shall remind myself that I'm a human being and not demand perfection of you until I am perfect. So you're safe. <laughs> Starting each day, I shall strive to be more aware of the beautiful things in our world. I know there's ugliness, but there is also beauty. And don't let them tell you any differently. I'll look at the flowers. I'll look at the birds. I'll look at the children. I'll feel the cool breezes. I'll eat good food. Oink out and love it. And I'll share these things with you. One of the greatest compliments is to say to somebody, look at that sunset. Starting each day, I shall remind myself to reach out and touch you gently with my words, with my eyes, and with my fingers because I don't want to miss feeling you. And starting each day, I shall dedicate myself again to the process of being a lover and then see what happens. You know, I'm really convinced that if you were to define love, the only word big enough to engulf it all would be life. Love is life in all of its as aspects. And if you miss love, you miss life. Please don't. Thank you. In a video, la tansel irjabe wal ishtiraka fil qanat.